Our next lesson comes to us from 2 Timothy. It's the close of 2 Timothy from chapter 4, verses 9 through 22. What adds to the poignancy of this text is that uh, in all probability, these are the last words that the Apostle Paul wrote, at least the last we have preserved for us. If he wrote something after this, it's no longer preserved. So with that in mind, let us listen to these words. Writing to his young associate, Timothy, who's back in Ephesus, while Paul is in prison in Rome. Do your best to come to me soon, for Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful in my ministry. I have sent Tychicus to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas, also the books and above all the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm. The Lord will pay him back for his deeds. You also must beware of him, for he is strongly opposed to our message. At my first defense, no one came to my support, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them. But the Lord stood by me and gave me strength, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and save me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Greet Prisca and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. Erastus remained in Corinth. Trophimus I left ill in Miletus. Do your best to come before winter. Eubulus sends greetings to you, as do Pudens and Linus and Claudia and all the brothers and sisters. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts this day find acceptance in your sight. For you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. I'm sure there's something to be said for every season of the year, but so far as I am concerned, autumn is a season without rival. I love everything about autumn. I love the crisp coolness. I love the autumn sky, which is spectacular. It's blue during the day, and at night the heavens are, you feel like you can reach up and touch the stars. I like the autumn clouds that resemble large puffs of cotton balls sometimes. Some of my fondest memories are inseparably linked to this particular season of the year. The smell of freshly raked leaves burning. I miss that. Living in cities where we're not allowed to burn leaves anymore. Sometimes I even drive into the country just to smell the leaves burning. Trips to the state fair in Mississippi as a child growing up. The taste of freshly pulled taffy. Eating hot bowls of chili on Saturday night, which frequently my family did, sleeping under piles of blankets with the windows wide open, bonfires and pep rallies, the harvest moon. Did you see the moon last night? Look for it uh, this evening. It's going to be the hunter moon. The harvest moon was last month in September. The hunter moon is tonight if you can see it. Pep rallies, frost on the ground, smoke in the chimneys. Hay rides in the country, which as a teenager were particularly nice. If you had a date, it was usually so cool she had to snuggle up close to you, and so dark she couldn't see you blush. (laughs) I love the fall colors better than all, all the others. The reds and yellows and oranges are so spectacular, they almost take your breath away. And somewhere on each and every street, if you look for it, you can find a scene befitting a postcard. One of the most delightful things this Mississippi flatlander learned in moving to the hills of eastern Tennessee in 1984 was just how spectacular Mother Nature is with all of her autumn finery on. In Mississippi, we just faded from one season into the next. We didn't have many hardwoods like you do here. And one of the things I've so anticipated is the colors of this autumn. 
The newspaper says they're going to be delayed this year. They may not be as vibrant as other years because of the drought that we've had this summer. But I'm looking forward to that. It moves me in ways I can't explain. Just like the song the choir just sang this morning. I love the fall fashions. I could spend my whole life in flannel shirts and blue jeans. Corduroy slacks. Wool sweaters. Yes, it's a wonderful time of the year. And so far as I'm concerned, at least, it's the best time. And yet... There is another side to autumn's tale. The season has about it something of a sad and melancholy tone, and we can dismiss this at first, but we can't deny what we feel within, because we know when autumn arrives that winter is not far behind, that the oranges and yellows and reds of October will soon give way to the browns and blacks and grays of November. And as we look upon God's created order, we can see, if we're attentive, constant reminders that even as there is a season for birth and for growth, so also in the providence of God is there a season for decay and for death. It's part of the natural order. And if we listen, not just look, but if we listen, we may just hear Autumn's subtle admonition reminding us that there is an end for all things. There is a rhythm to life and to death and to faith. One of these sounds, I haven't heard it since I've been here. We are on the outer edge of the eastern flyway from might upgrading birds. But one sound of autumn that I long to hear is described by Hal Borland in his book entitled The Book of Days. Listen to this description. Most birds migrate in silence, but not geese. Whether you're walking down a city street or standing in a suburban backyard or working in a rural wood, wood lot, you know when the geese fly over. First you hear that distant gabble, a faint clamor that seems to echo from the whole sky. You search the sky and the gabble comes closer and then you see them flying high, making a V, almost like a pencil line of dots. You listen and you watch, and the flight is so high it seems almost leisurely. If it is a close V formation, it is almost certainly Canada geese. If it is a looser V, rippling and waving, and one line is longer than the other, it is the less common snow geese. Whichever... The flock's gabbling is like the voice of restless autumn, and the flight never wavers. On and on, over the hills and the towns and the cities, to the far horizon and still beyond, southward, until only that restless echo, faint and haunting, remains. They are footloose as the autumn wind, and they follow the sun there is something both exhilarating and faintly sad in the echo of their going. Maybe it is the echo of another summer gone. Maybe it is the freedom song of the skies. But whatever, it haunts the earthbound heart. And so it is. If we carefully observe, if we carefully listen, we may just see and hear autumn's reminder that there is a beginning and an end for all things. For the year, for each of us and those we love, and as I want to emphasize this morning, for the opportunities for service and growth that are before us right now. The text for today's message, 2 Timothy 4.21, <clears throat> from the Apostle Paul, the context of this message is, is so important. Because as he's writing this, he's at the end of his life. He is old and tired. He's been deserted by a lot of his friends and supporters. His health is at issue. He is awaiting imminent word as to whether he will be executed or released. And the fact of the matter is, we don't know what word the Apostle Paul received. There's speculation about that and tradition says this or says that. But we're not certain whether he was ever released or whether he was executed immediately upon leaving the prison. Anyway, he writes to young Timothy, whom he misses. Such a personal letter. 
tells him to bring a cloak he left behind someplace. He tells him to bring the books he left and especially the parchments, which are the scriptures that he wanted. He sends greetings to friends and fellow workers. And then he says, almost as an aside, when he's closing the letter, do your best to come before winter. Now, why the urgency of this appeal? You see, what Paul and Timothy both realized was that the season for navigation in the Mediterranean Sea closed in the winter. And if Timothy was going to board a ship and get to Rome, he had to leave right away or he would have to wait till the following spring. And by that time, the Apostle Paul could well be dead. So this text and this situation reminds us that there may be things that we can do right now. Opportunities we can seize, challenges we can accept. Missions of mercy we can perform. Words of kindness and affection that we can speak. Which may never come our way again. Do your best to come before winter. One of the most powerful and persuasive sermons ever preached in this country. Was preached on this text. It was preached every year for 40 years by Dr. Clarence E. McCartney. First at the Arch Street Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia. Pennsylvania, and then later at the First Presbyterian Church of Pittsburgh. Many lives were transformed by that one sermon, and it seemed to have a particular appeal and effect on the numerous medical students in Pittsburgh that frequented the First Presbyterian Church there. And this sermon of McCartney's entitled Come Before Winter occupies a place of honor in the history of the American pulpit, and rightly so. I had heard about this sermon before I ever heard it. I've never read the sermon, but you can get a recording of it from the Union Theological Seminary in Richmond, Virginia. They're writing a recording library, and one year I ordered it just to listen to it. Before I ever heard of the message, or heard the message, I knew of the text, and I knew of the context. And this text has touched at my heart every autumn as it comes round. Now, I have no desire to be morbid here on this beautiful morning, but I know, as you must know, that some autumn will be my last, and it will be your last as well. It will be my last to read this text, or to preach it, or to heed it. And some will be yours as well. It makes little, if any, difference whether you're young or old, healthy or sick, ready or not. No one here is promised tomorrow. We have opportunities before us to grow, to worship, to serve, to give. If you're thinking, I'll get around to that later, don't deceive yourself. You may be kidding yourself. You're not kidding your Lord. Come before winter. I want to use this text in three specific dimensions of our life as disciples. To begin with, I would encourage you to come before winter. Come before winter to your senses, really, about what matters and what doesn't matter. Come to your senses about what is important in life and how to distinguish that from what is Trivial and temporary and narrowly self-serving. Trivial pursuit isn't just a board game we like to play, many of us. It's an apt description of the lives of far too many people. And we waste so much of our living by allowing the media or Wall Street or Madison Avenue or our peers to try to convince us as to what makes for happiness and fulfillment and greatness in life. And these ideas are futile. They lead to brick walls, dead ends. If we had only listened to the word of God in scripture. If we had only paid attention to the testimony of those who have walked this path before us. We would have known that there is no lasting contentment or complete fulfillment. In the selfish accumulation of things. In the relentless pursuit of personal honors. In the preoccupation with external stimulants 
in the practice of indiscriminate sexuality, in the cruel search for power, in the maniacal quest for fame, and how tragic it is when women and men live so much of their lives with mistaken and futile notions of what really leads to contentment and fulfillment and happiness in life. And so I urge you, before winter arrives, comes to your senses about what really matters and invest yourself unreservedly and unashamedly in those matters. Come before winter. I would use this text in a second sense to urge you while you still have the time and the inclination to accept those responsibilities that love places on you, especially with respect to those closest to you, family and friends. The next winter will come and go. Spring will be here before that. And the earth will be decked by a new crop of flowers, but also by the fresh graves of some of our present opportunities. There are deeds of love you have wanted to do. There are words of kindness and affection you've longed to speak to people who have touched your life, but you haven't. And you've hesitated. And you thought, well, I'll get around to this sometime later. Right now my life is so hectic. Don't kid yourself. You may never have the chance to do what you can do this day. I preached a version of this sermon when I was in Tennessee years ago. And there was an older man in the church there that said after I preached the sermon, he decided to write an elementary school teacher that had so impacted his life. And he wrote her a letter telling her what she had meant to him. The next week he received a letter back from her daughter saying that her mother had died the previous week. What have you wanted to do? What has the Lord placed on your heart? There's no better time to do it than right now. Are there marriages coming apart, which if worked on right now could be healed? But next year, maybe the damage done or the wounds inflicted would be irreparable. Are there strained relationships between you and friends, neighbors? Torn relationships between parents and children, which are begging for resolution. For some of us here this morning, this will be our best and maybe even our last opportunity to do anything about these words from God. And so in a second sense, I encourage you to come before winter to those responsibilities that love is placing on you towards significant people in your own life. And of course, it's important that we come to our senses about what's important. It's important that we accept those opportunities and responsibilities that love places on us. But since this could well be the autumn of your faith as well as your life, I would urge you in a third sense to come before winter to your God to your God have you ever made a full commitment to your God to his church to his world and how do you measure that what I'm saying applies to everyone here today but I hope and I'm so thankful we have some young people here today because I want to say a word to them in particular because sometimes when we're younger even when we're older we think uh, oh this God business is important It's important that I confess my sins, that I make a commitment to Christ and His church. But I'll get around to that later. There's no rush. Right? Wrong. History and experience reveal that while we may think we can get around to this at any time, the next time God speaks to us, our ears may have grown deaf. And the next time God demonstrates His love or His power or His beauty, Our vision may have become too dim to see it. And the next time God tugs at our hearts, maybe they've grown too cold to respond. We are all creatures of habit. And we are easily imprisoned by our own attitudes and our own outlooks. And if we fail to respond to God when we feel it, 
the next time God tugs at our hearts, we may not be capable of responding. One thing is for sure, no one here knows that they'll be here tomorrow. And that's why Paul writes to the Corinthians and he says to them, Behold, now is the acceptable time. This is the day of salvation. And his words are as valid for our day as they were for his own. There's an old Chinese proverb that says the best time to plant an oak tree is a hundred years ago. The next best time is today. In religious literature, we read a great deal about people who come to Christ, have conversion experiences as adults. It's not as common as you think. I would say fully 95% of the people in this congregation, of those sitting here this morning, 95% of you, I would wager, maybe even more, are here because you were raised in the church. You were raised by parents who took the faith seriously. And when people come to the church for the first time, certainly it happens. I was reading just this week of the conversion of Dorothy Day in an earlier day and her conversion experience. But that's rare. And when people join the church, most people are just returning to a church. They've already been members of a church somewhere. If you go to a revival meeting, a big public one like a Graham revival, I assure you, 95, 98% of the people walking down the aisle are just coming back to a commitment they made years ago. And rarer than an adult conversion is a deathbed conversion. A lot of people think, well, at least on my deathbed I'll make a commitment. I've been a minister for nearly 50 years now. I've experienced one of these in my very first church and none since. The fact of the matter is most people die as they live with or without God. And the fact remains that most of us usually die in hospitals. We are sedated. We're on machines. We do not have the capacity to think clearly or to act decisively. So don't assume you'll just wait till the end to make a commitment to the God who has created you and who in Jesus Christ has redeemed you. It's so important to give ourselves to Christ when we're young. That's when we build habits and patterns that will bless us for the balance of our lives. If these rafters could talk, If the pews on which you're seating could share their secrets, they would tell you the story of hundreds, maybe thousands of lives of people who missed out on the kingdom of God because when God spoke to them, they said later, and later never came. There's a wonderful story in one of William Barclay's books on the parables, and he tells a story about the three little apprentice devils who are getting ready to be sent to earth to do their damage among human beings. And so they all have to go and report to Satan how they intend to destroy human beings. And the first little devil says, well, I'm going to tell them that there's no God. And Satan said, that won't work. Most people kind of know in their heart of hearts there is a God somewhere up there. The second one said, well, I'm going to tell them there's no hell. And Satan said, that won't work either. Most people have experienced enough hell on earth they know there's a hell. And the third little devil said, well, I'm just going to tell them there's no hurry. And Satan smiled. He said, you tell them that and you'll ruin them by the millions. There's just no hurry. Dwight L. Moody, the famous evangelist of an earlier day, came home from a meeting one night. And the woman who was acting as his host asked Mr. Moody, well, were there any conversions tonight at your service? He said, yes, there were two and a half She said, you mean two adults and one child, don't you? He said, oh, no, ma'am, I mean two children and one adult. A child has his whole life to give to God. An adult only has part of a life to give. Maybe that is why the writer called the preacher in Ecclesiastes wrote, as we heard this morning, so remember your creator while you're young before those dismal days come when you will say, I don't enjoy life. Today, you can come to God if you've never made that decision. And in fact, any of us here today can. But it may be the autumn of your life and your faith. 
And so in conclusion, before winter comes, come to your senses about what matters and what doesn't. Come to those responsibilities that love is placing on you with respect to family and friends and significant people in your own life. And come at last to your God. Make a new commitment or a fresh commitment. And how you will worship and how you will grow and how you will serve and how you will give. Dr. McCartney preached that famous sermon, Come Before Winter, for the 40th and last time in 1955. And I will close with the oft-quoted conclusion of that sermon. Once again, then, I repeat these words of the apostle, Come Before Winter. And as I pronounce them, common sense, experience, conscience, scripture, the Holy Spirit, the souls of just men made perfect, and the Lord Jesus Christ all repeat with me, come before winter. Come before the haze of Indian summer has faded from the fields. Come before the November winds strip the leaves from the trees and send them whirling over the meadows. Come before snow lies on the uplands, And the meadow brook is turned to ice. Come before your life is over and your probation is ended. And you stand before God to give an account of the use you have made of the opportunities which in his grace he has granted you. Come before winter. Come to thy God in time. Youth, manhood, old age, past. Come to thy God at last. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, if by your grace some word of yours has reached us this morning, if some conviction has been laid upon us with respect to our own lives, if some new truth has dawned upon our minds or some appeal moved our cold hearts, then give us the grace to respond to the promptings of your Holy Spirit while we have the opportunity and the inclination. For we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen.